Hey, everybody. Welcome to Big Blend Radio's military show, where every first Monday we talk military history with Mike Guardia, who is an award-winning author, a military historian, and a U.S. Army veteran. And along with many other books, Mike is the author of the widely acclaimed biography, How More a Soldier Once and always, and it chronicles the life of Lieutenant General Harold G. Moore, whose battlefield leadership was popularized by the film We Are Soldier, We Were Soldiers, starring Mel Gibson. And Mike was recently named Author of the Year by the Military Writers Society of America. And we're so happy he's been on our show for years. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the first time we get to announce it. We're going to have every first Monday of the month, we're going to have him on the show. And uh, today he is joining us with his latest book. It's called Danger Forward, The Forgotten Wars of General Paul F. Gorman. You can get on Amazon now or go to his website. You'll see all the other books. I can't keep up with how many. Go to MikeGuardia.com. So welcome back, Military Mike. How are you? Hey, Lisa. Hey, Nancy. I'm doing great. Always great to be on the show. Happy Thanksgiving and a, and, and a happy Black Friday to you both. And holidays, yes, because this is during December Happy 6th, holidays. I know, today's Black Friday, but well, apparently we all don't care about how much our TV sets are. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're all here, no, but but yeah, the holidays are coming up, excited about your first uh, Monday show coming up, and uh, Paul Gorman, uh, to talk about him, mm. I know you've been talking about this book coming out for a while now, and Correct. Nancy grabbed hold of it, and she keeps mm -hmm. running in, it's one of those books, every few, you know, chapters, did you know he did this, did you, he's a badass, and sorry, <laughs> but I, I don't know how his family's going to feel me saying that, but that's what I'm Nancy sure they'd says. agree. Yeah. He's a warrior. He was like a real like warrior. Like this smart is, guy. Yeah. Really um, smart. How did you first find out about Paul Gorman? So let's see. Uh, the first I actually heard of Paul Gorman, I want to say it was around 2014 or 2015. I actually came across his name while I, while, while I was doing research for Crusader. That was the book on Don Starry. And I came across Gorman's name as one of the intellectual giants who was helping to rebuild the army in the in the wake of the post Vietnam malaise, and uh, you know, I uh, I knew that he did. Uh, I knew that he did some very important things with the U.S. Army's uh, training and doctrine command in uh, trying to revitalize the Army's training methods and trying to get a solid curriculum that was performance based instead of just metrics based. And uh, I knew about him only in the terms of what he accomplished within that uh, small like four year window uh, when he was helping to rebuild the Army. But I really didn't dig in deep into what he did beyond that. And uh, then fast forward to the fall of 2018, when I was giving a uh, presentation at Colin Powell Leadership Academy and the yeah. professor of military science there, he said, Mike, I read your book on Crusader, but let me ask you something. Uh, have you ever heard of a guy named Paul Gorman? And I said, yeah, you know, I came across his name while I was writing that book on Don Starry. And he said, well, Mike, you know, he's still with us and you know he did so much more beyond what people typically think he did at trade off you know here let me tell you about some of the things that he's done he said well you know paul gorman for one he's 1950 west point graduate you know he uh, had his first taste of combat in the hilltop in, in the hilltop battles of korea and mike did you also know that he was the commander uh, of american forces at the battle of bong trang he was awarded the distinguished uh, service cross for that and Mike, did you also know that he was on the Paris Peace Delegation and he was the principal mm -hmm. architect of the Pentagon Papers? That's and crazy. I said, and Dude. I said, God, I, 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 I had no idea he did any of that. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he and he said, you know, not only that, he stayed in the military, of course, after, uh, you know, after um, trying to rebuild the army. And he ended up commanding a uh, ended up commanding an infantry division for stationed in West Germany. But not only that, he was also the commander of U.S. Southern Command, Southcom, during the early part of the 1980s, and he was commanding Southcom while we uh, had troops in El Salvador, while we were actively supporting the Contras in Nicaragua, and also when American forces invaded Grenada. And I'm just thinking to myself, wow, you know, I mean, he's done so much throughout his lifetime. I mean, mm. you know, from the uh, you know from the hilltops of North Korea to the halls of the Pentagon to the jungles of Nicaragua. How come I've never heard of this guy outside of the mm. few years that he spent with Tradoc? I mean, it, it's just, <laughs> I mean, it was mind blowing. I was telling myself, I, I have to meet this guy. I, I have to get a story down on paper. And uh, yeah, the, that, uh, that is the roundabout way of how I ultimately, uh, wow. I ultimately came to the project. 
Did you meet him? Uh, we have never met in person, but we have done a lot of Zoom interviews. Uh, even those Zoom meetings that we have, I mean, just uh, just an incredible energy that he gives off. And even today at the age of 94, I mean, he's wow. still just going strong, still sharp as it, any 30-year-old I've met. I mean, seriously. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing. It's, he's an amazing person. I mean, I, if you read the book, you climb into this guy's mind on how organized he can mm -hmm. make things like even there's right. one part in the book you're talking about um, how the ammunitions were stored mm -hmm. and it would take 12 hours for the guys to go in and get the ammunition they needed. And he's like, well, that's stupid. Now well, I'm going to fix that. And, right. you know, it gets it down to like two to four hours to pull out the ammunition just by thinking how things should be properly stored so that when you need something fast, you can get it. So he, he kind of goes back to the basics of every single problem and fixes the problem mm -hmm. to ensure the outcome that he wants. I mean, it, and not very many people really have the wherewithal to think it through and then make it happen. That's right. what impressed me is like, he'd see a problem, think it through, oh, this is how it should be done. And he would make it happen. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, he is one of the most gifted problem solvers that I've ever spoken to. You know, I mean, yeah. just to hear his stories of how he would deconstruct this. And, you know, I really think that shines a light on the fact that this isn't really something that can be taught. I don't think problem solving and, mm. uh, and that type of critical thinking is something that you can learn in a classroom. I think it's something, mm. that, uh, something that experience either teaches you or it's something that you just have an innate talent for and mm. then your experiences build upon that and they expand that talent over time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, just incredible how he could deconstruct these problems. And not only that, how he could, how he could also motivate those people, not only those who served under him, but inspire those who were working with him at the time. That I really think is the is the sign of a true leader to be able to problem solve on that level while simultaneously inspiring those not only beneath you but those who are who are who are working in a lateral sense alongside mm. you. Yeah, because I can imagine there's always going to be the few that have a jealousy problem with sure. it, you know, who want to one up the other person so they look better. Yeah. All those kind of things that happen when oh, yeah. you have a bunch of humans together. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no matter whether it's in the service or not in the service, when you put a mm -hmm. lot of people together, competition comes out and yeah. and there's healthy competition and not so healthy. But mm -hmm. he just like seemed like a person who I'm gonna deal with the problem and I'm not gonna stop till it's the way it should be. And just it's amazing what he's done. Yeah. And I think it's it, interesting with what you've been writing over the years. I know you get into, um, here's the F-14 or the F-15 and the, you know, the armor and, and uh -huh. you know, the artillery and all of that. And, um, but you always, no matter what, bring the human connection into those who serve in the military. And I think, you know, as readers and what you see on the news, we always forget the human. This is human. They're human beings, you know, and, and I feel like sometimes we have that mm -hmm. disconnect and you are always bringing that to the forefront and making it very accessible for those who are in the military and understand all the lingo and mil and history buffs who know the different wars and then people like us who go, damn, I didn't know that happened <laughs> and, and make it accessible that we understand more than yeah. the headlines that the news give us and their opinions. There's this getting to know what people went through serving like in, in Vietnam, Korea, mm -hmm. like you're saying. Um, Nancy, you were talking about in one of the many times you kept running in going, dude, <laughs> you gotta check this out. Uh, you said that, you know, going from, you know, growing up in, in the Vietnam era, um, you really mm. got a better idea of what happened in the Vietnam War in oh, Korea sure. than um, what you lived, you know, as a civilian seeing what was going on through the news. And, and so your understanding changed. Yeah, the, I, the, the whole thing, you know, it, in the, the mid 60s, um, coming out of high school and everybody's, you know, having protests, some for the Vietnamese war, some against it, mostly against it, and not having any real way of understanding what was actually going on. You couldn't trust the newspapers because it, it, 
they made no sense. Your teachers at school didn't want to talk about it. Your parents really didn't know anyway. At least mine didn't. They were like, Ooh. so it was really hard because you saw your classmates going off to a war <laughs> that nobody really seemed to be able to explain. Mm -hmm. You know, and so reading your book, I was like, oh, so that's what it was. Oh, so that was, you know, because for years I just thought, okay, well, it was just we had dumb leaders at the time. That That's how I summed it up. We had dumb uh -oh. politicians. <laughs> okay, here we go. Decisions, <laughs> and that's it. I don't disagree. You know, but, <laughs> yeah, you know, so that's how I felt about it. And then I read your book, I'm like, oh, wow, look at that. Oh, I didn't know that, you know. And it's not like I spent a lot of time researching it, you know, because I had my young life to get on with and I was busy and I just was like glad when it was over. That's pretty much how I think everyone I, was. Yeah, just glad that it was over and please mm -hmm. don't do it again because you had so many people. We never should have gone there, never should have been there. And I don't think anybody who was talking at the time that was really very vocal actually had any idea what they were talking about mm -hmm. they were just yeah. loud about it but they really nobody seemed to know it's kind of so like just, today yeah, yeah with <laughs> afghanistan i know we're going to talk exactly. a lot about afghanistan um on their next segment coming out january 3rd everybody um but it, it does connect is there a parallel and we see a lot of people talk about that there's a parallel mm -hmm. between what happened in vietnam and afghanistan right yeah Wow. So getting into what was going on in the army and he deciding it has to be rebuilt. Tell us about that, where yeah. he decided this needs to change. And then are, don't other people say, no, you're not allowed to change. Don't you know, recreate the wheel. Doesn't that happen? <laughs> right. Well, I think it was a bit easier to get the ball rolling on change because I think uh, to anyone who was paying at all attention to what was happening, not only in the army, but what was happening, um, you know, throughout uh, throughout American society as a whole, and just how savagely public opinion had turned against the war. I mm. think everyone who was paying any bit of attention could earnestly look at the situation and say, "Gosh, there really needs to be some changes made here." You know, when we have at least, you know, this amount of the army who is coming in without a high school diploma, when we have soldiers who are deserting, when we have soldiers who are attacking mm -hmm. and even killing their leaders, when we have, you know, upwards of, you know, 30 to 40 percent of soldiers in any given unit who are admitting to drug use and, mm -hmm. you know, who are showing up at work higher than a kite. And, mm -hmm. you know, then there's no yeah, system yeah, in place. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and when, when there's no system in place to get rid of these bad apples, and not only that, you have an American public that's hostile towards us. Well, gosh, you know, we really need to uh, we really need to fix the situation here. We need to increase our combat readiness and we need to have these control mechanisms in place, not only to keep bad apples out, but also do some realistic training that is going to make us combat effective in the field. So I think it was easier for him to get the ball rolling on that. And when he finally got to the forefront of doing it, you know, he had a very uh, big uh, he had a very big support mechanism behind him saying, okay, well, Paul, here's what we need to accomplish. So I'm giving you a very wide berth in which to operate. So find out what the problems are. Give me ideas on how to fix them and no ideas off limits. I can be a sounding board. Let's find out what works. Let's find out what doesn't work so we can make this change happen. And I think going into it, they all knew that the change wasn't going to happen overnight. They said, okay, it took mm -hmm. us you know, it took us 10 plus years of fighting in Vietnam, you know, 10 plus years of social and a lot of political unrest to get to this point. It's probably going to take us about that long, maybe even longer to, to fix the problem, but let's at least get some ideas down on paper. So one of the first things he did was he said, okay, well, I need to look at how soldiers are training. If I'm going into each one of these training centers and 80% of the training is happening inside of a classroom, well, that's probably not the best way to do business. What I need to do is I need to get soldiers in the field. I need to get them training under realistic conditions, under realistic scenarios that are going to replicate not only what they'll see in combat, but also replicate what the future threats might be. Because one of the things that Gorman commented on, he said, you know, the Army is very good at training to win the last war that it fought. It has, mm -hmm. a, it has a bit of trouble projecting what the anticipated threats are going to be. 
you know, he said that, uh, you know, he also said that when he was a staff officer in, I, I think it was the 1950s, could have been the early 60s, but he said a lot of the uh, training that I sat in on was geared towards, you know, trying to, was geared towards trying to win some of the, uh, some of the battles that we had seen on the plains of Europe in World War II. Mm. And, uh, you know, what, what, what and also what the Marines had seen in the amphibious operations in the Pacific. And he said, you know, that's not dissimilar to what other generations were focused on. You know, during the 1920s, all of the Army staff schools were focused on how to defeat the Germans in trench warfare when we were probably never going to see that type of combat ever again. So we said, okay, what I need to do is I need to say, all right, I need to get these guys out of the classroom. I need to get them focused on, on a, a basic standard level of competency that will work across different operational environments. And we need to incorporate something in the curriculum that can be adapted to any future threat that we meet. And what might those future threats be? What might they look like? Wow. See, that's smart. I mean, it's just, yeah. I mean, it's like it if you sense. always go on, you have to progress, not go okay. back. You have to still mm -hmm. take lessons from before, right? But right. learn to get into that. And Nancy was talking about that when she was mm -hmm. reading the book about, you know, do we know, did we know how to fight in the swamps of, you know, of Vietnam and Korea? Mm -hmm. And then that goes back to, well, didn't we learn some things? I shouldn't say we, because I wasn't there, but didn't the, our military learn like doing things like in the Louisiana maneuvers? Wasn't that part of mm -hmm. learning? I mean, wasn't that World War II? Am I getting messed up? That no, I mean uh, that was World War II, the Louisiana maneuvers. Yeah, because yeah. they had they went through swamps, and mm -hmm. you don't want to be in the swamp in Louisiana. <laughs> I've been there. I, I love it, but <laughs> you, you're going to get your leg bitten off <laughs> by a gator. <laughs> but but you know you do need to learn all those things, and they do. Right. I mean, to me, it's interesting. We have all those things, but it seems like for Vietnam, we were not prepared as well compared to World War II, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, well, it, it, uh, I, I'd, say that, uh, I'd say that the professionalism of our soldiers going into it uh, was head and shoulders above what we started with in World War II. Uh, okay. It's just at the strategic level, uh, they really couldn't clearly communicate what our objectives were, and not only that, uh, the military, in a very real, in a very real sense, was being hamstrung by mm -hmm. uh, by a lot of rules of engagement that discouraged initiative in, instead of promoting it. You know, to uh. say nothing of the fact that uh, we were engaging in a high in a uh, full scale, high intensity conflict that was expected to be fought on the cheap. There was going to be no uh, widespread mobilization of the National Guard or the Army Reserve. And not only that, you were, um, you were pursuing a lot of personnel policies that were undermining unit cohesion. You know, whereas in World War II, you would send a unit overseas and that unit more or less would stay intact throughout the entirety of the war. You know, minus maybe a few replacements that were brought in here and there to replace you know, some of the soldiers who were tragically killed. But you know, you had a uh, you had a different approach in Vietnam, where you not only had a big swath of the population that could apply for and get some draft deferments, but you had these soldiers going in and out of theater on a one-year rotational basis. And by the time they even survived to the one-year mark, if they did survive that long, you know, they would take all the knowledge and know-how, and uh, you know, every bit of useful information of what the enemy was doing and how to survive, they would take it with them back to the civilian world, and they would say, okay, well, you know. The next guy who takes my place will have to figure it out. You know, there was no mechanism to keep a lot of the good experienced soldiers in there longer so they could teach the incoming people how to do it better than they could. Oh, wow. So he walks in, mm -hmm. Paul Gorman walks in and goes, we're changing this. We're going to we're going to mm -hmm. fix it and take some initiative. Nancy said that he snuck over. Where is it? He went to Germany, Nancy. Where did he he went to another place that he was supposed to be? At one point, he um, he just said his his papers were in the mail because he decided he wanted to go. Oh, to one. yeah, he went to some. <laughs> he went to San yeah. Francisco, and because he oh. was going to go, yeah, he went to San Francisco yeah. to join a, a, a troop that he wanted to join. He just no, I'm going by. And just said his papers <laughs> were in the mail. There. What was that about? And showed up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Like so yeah. So if <laughs> but we, we like uh, stories like that. I mean, come on. Yeah. It's like. You have to, that's bullshit, like to, it is. you know. It is. So yeah, if we wind the clocks back to 1952, um, he, he was fresh out of the infantry officer basic course. 
And uh, he really wanted to go to Korea, but it turns out that every graduating lieutenant in his class had been put on bulk orders to Germany. And Germany is about as far away as you can get from Korea before you start coming back. Mm. And, and he said, okay, well, the war is in Korea. That's where I want to be. I don't really want to go to Germany because there's nothing happening in Germany. I don't want to do, you know, I don't want to do, uh, you know, these, these, uh, these guard tours along the Iron Curtain or what have you. I really want to go where the action is. So what he decided to do is he said, okay, I'm going to clandestine, I'm going to very clandestinely disobey that order. I'm going to put myself on a train to San Francisco to Camp Stoneman, the main hub for replacements going in and out of Korea. And I'm going to go up to the camp personnel officer and I'm going to say, hi, my name is Paul Borman. Um, I, uh, should be on orders to Korea. And then the personnel officer looks at his little clipboard and says, huh, oh, Gorman, Gorman, I don't see that name on here. Um, uh, are you sure you have orders to go to Korea? I don't see your name anywhere on my list. And he said, well, okay, uh, let me call the G1 at the Pentagon, you know, let me call like the actual chief of the personnel division at the Pentagon. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get this all sorted out. So, you know, Gorman goes to a payphone or whatever it is, you know, gets on the horn with, uh, with, uh, you know, with the personnel office at the Pentagon and says, hi, my name is Paul Gorman. I'm here at Camp Stoneman right now. That's where I'm calling you from. Um, I'm supposed to be on orders to Korea, but the guy here at Camp Stoneman does not have my orders to go to Korea. Can you please send him some orders? And, uh, you know, the person on the other end, uh, you know, is probably thinking to himself, gosh, I don't know what caused this snafu. Yeah, man, I'll have your orders in the mail. We will send them right over. We'll wire them over if we have to. And uh, yeah, then he gets off the phone with him, goes back to the personnel uh, office at Camp Stoneman, and says, "Hey, I just got off the phone with the Pentagon, and yeah, they're going to send my uh, they're going to send my orders right over." And uh, <laughs> and the personnel officer at Camp Stoneman says, "Well, son of a gun, I just got a call from them too. They said, hey, sorry for the slip up, but they're going to send your orders right over.'" <laughs> and it was like maybe a week or two later that he was on a boat to Korea to, uh, to go to the front lines. And, uh, you know, he, he said in retrospect, he said, you know, at some point, the Army was probably well aware of what I was doing. And they were probably well aware of this ruse. But, Mike, you have to keep in mind, it was so rare for anybody who wanted to go to Korea that right. no questions were ever asked. Yeah. yeah, they're probably like, I don't know what's wrong with that dude, but go ahead and let him go. I have a <laughs> feeling that you don't ever want to get into like a prank war with him. Like, <laughs> oh no, uh -uh. <laughs> you know, when we first got to this country, uh, we lived in um, Port St. Lucie, Florida, and mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a friend, a young couple, married couple that moved in with us for a while. They were just getting their feet on the ground as a couple, yeah. you know, and they moved in and uh, <laughs> Carl is a Navy SEAL. Yeah. Just got out of being a SEAL. And I swear you'd come home and he would be hiding in a doorway in a very odd position. Like it was sneak Crazy. attack. Whenever we came home from whatever we we're doing, like he'd be on the roof or he'd be hiding somewhere that you don't know and just go yeah. like, you know, surprise. It was like Peter Sellers. Yeah. It was. It was totally like, and his mm -hmm. wife just, I mean, his wife couldn't stand it. I don't know if they're still married. I don't know if they're it still was, married. When we, but... were, we were like, oh yeah, what's going to happen now? So mm -hmm. it, you had to be so aware, but he was so silent. It was, mm -hmm. it was uh, Navajo, Black, Blackfoot Navajo guy too. Really? Okay. Like, don't, yeah. don't mess with him, man. Carl yeah. was, you do not mess bad. with him. Bad and there was one, I was going through one situation where somebody's like, listen, Lisa, I have a knife. And I'm like, no, Carl. He's <laughs> like, you got to do this. I'm like, no, no. You can have a, you know, you know, a disagreement with someone without a knife. But he um, was really, really one of those, you know, and I kind of feel mm -hmm. like Paul Gorman is one of those, like, if he wants to totally prank you on something, he's going to do it and do it well. Yeah. Would not surprise me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You Would know? not surprise me. Yeah. But it's interesting. He didn't want to go to Germany, but then he ended up in Germany and started a winery after going to Germany and enjoying wine in Germany. He sure did. He sure did. Yeah. So yeah, he, he did two tours in Germany. So the first one was not too long after Korea. Uh, he got there and he commanded an, uh, commanded an armored infantry company. And uh, this was really the uh, first sustained look that he was able to get at post-war Germany. And, you know, he was commenting on, you know, just how much the, uh, how much the West Germans had rebuilt since the end of the Second World War. And, you know, he said, you know, they, they weren't entirely back on their feet yet, but you could tell that life was slowly getting better for Germans of every stripe. And, you know, it was, uh, it was incumbent upon us, the Americans, to try to build um, long-lasting ties with the West Germans and to say, hey, you know, we, we really are committed to being your friends. 
And you know, for no other reason, let's please get along and cooperate because we know the red menace that's just on the other side of the inner German border. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, you know, while he was doing this, uh, the, I think that was also the first sustained look that he had, you know, to the German vineyard industry. Because when he would get up early in the morning to go for his PT runs, yeah, he would often he would often run through the uh, long and winding rows of the vineyards, and he was saying, "Man, this is really nice. It's pretty. It smells <laughs> mm -hmm. fantastic." Yeah, I think that this is something that you know that I would like to do as time goes on. And uh, when he got back to when he got back to Germany um, uh, a little over twenty years later, when he was commanding a division there, that really just reinforced it that there was something that he and Ruth, uh, his wife, wanted to do after they eventually left the military. And uh, yeah, the Cardinal Point Winery, uh, that, is, that is a very well-known place. I mean, that is, a, uh, that is a landmark for all of the vineyards on the Eastern Seaboard today. We're wow. going, we're going, it's on our list. We just yeah. drove through Maryland, um, Virginia, and we got lost in Maryland and Virginia, right outside <laughs> DC at night, and That's ended up me. driving through Manassas the day it's that we were airing to. the show. Yeah. No, I mean totally twirled around. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I, I don't know how we got out, but we did. And uh, but if I, know, I knew there was a, all, you know. yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it was. Um, they were GPS was sending us because of car accident. I was just like, okay. Then <laughs> if I had just known about the winery at that time, I would have said, Nancy, let's just go, go to the there. winery. But when we're going to go there, when we go back yeah. east, we're going to do that. But we were trying to get out of the cold. As you know, in Minnesota, it's oh, that yeah. season, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We're in Florida. Mm -hmm. we, we, we left north. It was nice here. It was like 20 <laughs> degrees with wind and snow going. And we're like, we're going to Florida. And like, I went as fast as I could because I love northeast Pennsylvania. It's not a knock on anything. But yeah. man, Florida is yeah. really quite nice, but all right. Well, when this airs, we'll be in Asheville getting cold again. So there okay, we go. Okay, well, that's but, good. <laughs> um, I know, thanks. But thanks. I think that's really interesting about his career. I mean, you've got mm -hmm. to think about from West Point to Korea, you know, Vietnam, uh, then, you know, going in and then looking at his work. Didn't he, you know, the, the Pentagon Papers, that's huge. That's right. Peace Treaties is huge, the Paris Pre mm -hmm. Peace Treaties. But didn't he also do some kind of work in regards to going over to Mexico and looking at what was going on with the cartels, or is that his connection with the CIA? What was going on there? I want that okay. scandal. <laughs> all right. All right. So let's see. So if we fast forward a little bit to 1983, and at this point, Paul Gorman is actually getting very close to his mandatory retirement date. He's been in uniform collectively uh, for a little over 33 years at this point. Wow. And he is offered command of one of the geographical combatant commands known as the U.S. Southern Command, or as it's, as it's more popularly known, uh, Southcom for short. And Southcom's area of responsibility is everything in Latin America from the end of Mexico mm -hmm. all the way down to the tip of South America at Tierra del Fuego and also includes most of the Caribbean. So if we take a look at what was happening throughout all of Latin America in the 1980s at this point, we see that Paul Gorman oh, yeah. really has his work cut out for him because, you know, I mean, you know, South America is a... Uh, is a is, is a hotbed of not only illegal drug cartels, but also there's there's a lot of uh, communist subversion going on. Yeah, and this is a uh, this is a clandestine war that is going on, and it's really not making headlines to the degree that many of our other major conflicts have. So you know, just to give you a uh, just to give you a summary of uh, of everything that is facing the uh, Southcom area at this point. You know, throughout in, in the early 1980s, you know, you have Guatemala that is still in the midst of a civil war. You have El Salvador that's being, uh, it's being o o overrun by communist guerrillas. Uh, the Sandinistas have taken over Nicaragua. Uh, Honduras and Salvadorans have been going at it like cats and dogs for years. You have communism in Cuba. You, uh, you have a Marxist government that, that has uh, stood up in Grenada. In Panama, you know, Manuel Noriega, he has an ongoing love-hate relationship with the U.S. You have drug cartels in Colombia. Mm -hmm. You have Argentina that still hasn't recovered from the Falklands War. And then meanwhile, right across Damn the it. border. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting tired. It's a mess. No wonder yeah. they're all taking cocaine. There's a lot it's of work. It's a mess. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. And then, you know, to add insult to injury, right across the border in Chile, you have, uh, you have uh, um, Augusto Pinochet, who's ruling Chile with an iron fist. Mm -hmm. And it's like, man, is there any part of Latin America at this point that is not going to be problematic for me, you know, as he's coming in to take command? So he says, okay, well, well the first thing I have to do is, okay, the first thing I have to tackle, the first thing that's going to be a big priority uh, for me from a military standpoint is trying to, uh, trying to deter the communists from further expansion 
in, in, inside of Latin America. So what I have to do is I have to deter the Cubans, I have to deter the Soviets, and I have to deter the Nicaraguans from spreading their ideology by force. So I said, okay, well, how do I do that and still stay below the threshold of sending in conventional forces? So what he does is he increases the capability of the, uh, of the friendly Latin American countries uh, he increases their uh, he increases their military capabilities to say, okay, I'm essentially going to give you guys equipment that you've never had before. I'm going to give you the top quality military equipment from America that we're allowed to sell you. And I'm going to increase your ability to fight at night. See, the thing that separates the American military from a lot of other militaries out there is that we own the night and we have uh, we have direct capabilities mm -hmm. and a very big technological support apparatus to help us fight and engage the enemy at night. And it's going to help you guys out, one, because that's when the communist guerrillas fight the most. They fight at night. And the drug cartels, you, you know, all of the um, all of the traficantes, they all tend to fight at night, too. So when we teach you these night fighting abilities and when, when we give you these night vision devices, we're going to teach you how to take care of these threats internally on the dime and with the full logistical backing of the U.S. government. Mm. And that right there is what laid the foundations mm. for a lot of the big disruptions within, within, within the drug trafficking industry down there. Also what helped uh, pave the way for the Contras victory against the Sandinistas and also the victory in the communist guerrillas in El Salvador. And uh, there, were, <laughs> there were a lot of very good, interesting stories about what happened um, at, at that point. You know, the story was um, involving a Peru that uh, that had that had imported a bunch of Soviet built helicopters, but at the same time they also imported uh, they also imported some night vision and night optics from the U.S. So Paul Gorman was now straddled with the uh, unenviable mm -hmm. task of trying to teach the uh, Peruvian Air Force how to adapt its how to adapt its American made uh, um, night vision devices to a to a uh, Soviet built helicopter. And wow. try to and try to teach the Peruvians how to use it without being detected by the Soviet advisors who were operating in that country. So, so the uh, oh, so yeah, so yeah, and uh, I, I won't spoil it for for anybody who uh, who hasn't read the book yet. But uh, yeah, just uh, just suffice to say that uh, there were some uh, very clandestine operations going mm -hmm. on that were happening under the cover of night, getting uh, technical and support crew into the Peruvian air bases and uh, trying to uh, trying to teach them how to use their equipment without being detected by the Soviet advisors, because oh, wow. that would have been a uh, I think that would have been an international incident that, uh, yeah. at the proportions if, you know, uh oh, you know, here in Peru, mm. uh, you know, an American technician crosses paths with a Soviet aviation advisor. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, and this is, it, it's it, so it, interesting it would not have me. been pretty. No. Uh, wow. But, and then there's also the mafia seems to always be poking their nose in somewhere. Yeah. I mean, they, oh, they really. Oh, oh, after yeah. this recording, we have a question for you on that. Because sure. It's, it's interesting. But mm. I do, we, you know, what's interesting, you know, talking about Thanksgiving, uh, uh, Thanksgiving dinner last night, uh, we were talking with some friends and we were talking, we were talking about your book, actually, and then yeah. talking about the whole, what mm -hmm. was going on in Mexico mm -hmm. and everything. And we were talking about Russia and, and you know, the Soviet, like with the Chinese and the Soviets, like mm -hmm. as Americans, we, if that's the two things, be wary. And, right. um, and I know saying, well, that's interesting because, you know, when we lived in Mexico, there was a whole bunch of Russians and, and, and I was wondering, mm -hmm. is there a connection where, I mean, maybe they just moved there and wanted to set up life and grow vineyards because they do. There are several great wineries owned by Russians. They're great. But uh -huh. I'm wondering about that history. When you think about communism and everything, what was going right. on? Like, did the Russians go over there at one point, like just through Central and South America? Oh, yeah. As part, was that part of a thing in history of we're going to go in this way and kind yeah. of settle or spread, like take over? What was going on? Like, how well, did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, they had quite a few Soviet advisors who laid up shop all throughout Latin America. You know, I mean, at any given point, you had quite a few in Cuba. You know, you, you also had Soviet advisors in Grenada. Uh, pretty much anywhere where there was a pro-Marxist government or there was a, uh, mm. a pro-Marxist uh, movement afoot, uh, you would have you would have Soviet advisors there, mm -hmm. and also even if the uh, even if the country was uh, was at, at, at least nominally capitalist, if they were using Soviet built equipment, yeah, you had one or two Russian advisors over there at any given point who were you know overseeing the 
overseeing the delivery, overseeing the training and the implementation mm -hmm. of equipment, you know, stuff like that. Hmm. Interesting. It's like even, even when we lived in different parts of Africa, the Russians were always there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Always. Yeah. And they do make good wine. I, yeah. Apparently vodka, they, no, but you wine. Know, and, they, and they, I mean, it starts with having an um, embassy or consulate, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and then expands from there. Wow. Yeah. But Paul Gorman, man, what a life. This is epic. I mean, this is yeah. an epic, epic story. I can't lot. wait to get reading it because, you know, Nancy did kind of like everything here, here. He did this and then he did that. And then I he think, did this. Well, and then I he think did it that. should be, <laughs> I think it should be a textbook in schools. I'm really a proponent so. of getting rid of the dried, boring textbooks that history classes make you try to read and understand um, because it's not presented in a way that mean that's meaningful mm -hmm. so i would like to see your your books and some of the other authors well she was talking about authors. excellence she said like uh, what with how more the leaders uh, the excellence and leadership that this yeah. also ties in danger for mm -hmm. paul gorman i mean do you think they met i was uh, think there's somebody would like they might have because well they have know. a certain <laughs> they have a certain set of principles that they yes. stand by and that that guides them to make decisions that fall in line with their principles they don't very often wave over and go well this is the easier thing to do mm -hmm. they don't do that they're like no we're going to do it this way because of this that and the other mm -hmm. and they stick to it regardless of what happens to them um, in their careers they have right. that ability Moral. to like i'm going to do this because it's the right thing to do as opposed to if I do this, it's going to hurt my career. They don't, they're like, no, this is the right thing to do. They have higher ideals and they see in the future, they have a big picture. Right. That is more than them. It's more mm -hmm. than their career. It's a picture for how they see the world. It's a picture of who's, you know, that we want, we want democracy to win. Right. You know, they have that as opposed to just their personal advancement Correct. which is a big thing when you're looking at leadership mm -hmm. now so i say they run for <laughs> no but oh, I did, think did, you... did they meet did, did you think they ever met i'm sure they probably met at one point you know i mm -hmm. never asked gorman if he met how more or not yeah. but uh you know given just uh how close they were to the front lines of rebuilding the army mm. in the wake of the Vietnam War. I'm sure they must have crossed paths at least once or yeah. twice. At least they talk probably to you. know yeah. or would know who each other is. Oh, yeah. He needs a museum too. Mm -hmm. He needs a museum. Paul Gorman. Maybe they have a section at the winery dedicated to him. I would hope so. Yeah. Well, I'll let you know. <laughs> we're going to go. I don't know we're when gonna we're going to go, but we're going to go because, you know, we'll end up out there again. But, you know, yeah. very, very fascinating. Well, we look forward to the next one. Tell everybody what the next book is because, I mean, it's just like, okay. non how are you doing all of this? Man. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's the only it's, thing I'm good at. It's the, you're, oh, well, I'm you're sure definitely good at it, but I, I, I know that's not true. But, I mean, this is amazing, and the stories are really good, and, uh, you know, just you're just you just keep going you know well, and, and also very readable because it's not an easy that's why i say you're set, you make it so accessible read. for us yeah yeah it's readable and your books are readable and like memorable they're not like like i say that the history text that you had to read mm -hmm. as a kid that was just like oh geez let me out of right. class can i now be truant or something yeah because i look at, <laughs> look at sky break sky break is still i i mean that was just mm. epic you know and I, I like that that book and how's that going because i know that's oh, going well great. received i knew it yeah. would be yeah. Yeah. this is cool yeah. awesome so next it's gotten great reviews story. so far yeah. i've got it i mean it's yeah. like every other day something good's going i'm like man mm. you are working hard and and it's paying off i see a lot of action going out there on Twitter and everything. And it's so cool to see such a good following mm -hmm. on your YouTube. You do a lot on YouTube. I do. I man. Do. Yeah, I man. Yeah. Cool. You're working it. He's working it. But yeah, next is Combat Stories. Actually, it's called The Combat Diaries. The Combat and Diaries. There you yeah, go. Yeah. And, and that is a collection of short stories from a variety of veterans from World War II. And what, what I tried to accomplish with the combat diaries is really just take a uh, cross-section of the typical veteran's 
uh, who served in that conflict. And, you, you know, within these two dozen stories that I, I have recorded uh, for this book, uh, they're veterans sharing their experiences fighting on the front lines. And uh, it runs a pretty wide spectrum. You know, uh, there was a pilot at Midway. You know, then I have another story of a man who was, who was the first man on Omaha Beach. I have a, uh, have a story of a uh, man who's rather small in stature, but he, he's a uh, small but mighty. He was a ball mm -hmm. turret gunner on a B-17. And uh, wow. you had to have a, a small body in order to fit inside that turret. So even wow. though he was only about five foot three, five foot four, uh, just incredible stories that he has to tell. You know, he, he wow. would tell stories about engaging pilot, engaging these German pilots, you know, from the ball turret. And he said that sometimes they were so close, it felt like I was firing at point blank. And yes. they were so close that I could actually see the color of their hair and the color of their eyes. Oh, wow. thank you. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was pretty, oh, pretty wow. epic. Yeah, and then there was another gentleman who was a uh, who, who who was a uh, crewman on a B twenty four. He got shot down over Germany and spent the remainder of the war inside of three different German POW camps. And, oh wow! And I mean, my God, just the fact that he lived to tell that story uh, is yeah. just beyond incredible. And um, then after that, I uh, I'm, I'm pretty much taking the same construct and I am applying it to the Vietnam War. There's a book called Blood Alley. And uh, that is a story that pretty much follows the uh, same construct, except they're, uh, they're telling the frontline stories of men who, uh, who fought on the front lines in Vietnam. Oh, wow. And uh, two, of the, two of the prominent characters that I can share with you for that book, one is a gentleman named Dan Crowley. And uh, he was a combat engineer who coincidentally was also at the Battle of Bong Trang. And, uh, oh, his, wow. bata and his battalion, mm -hmm. his, his engineer battalion was attached to Paul Gorman's unit. Okay. So small oh, world. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Small wow. World. And, yeah. And <laughs> then there is another gentleman who was featured in that book. His name is Tom McCullough. And uh, Tom's claim to fame, and I don't know if this is the best way to describe it. It's just the best analogy that I can think of right offhand. He's pretty much the anti Ron Kovic, and in mm. that he was injured in a similar way that Ron Kovic was. Um, but instead of becoming anti war and writing memoirs like Born on the Fourth of July, he was pro war throughout his entire life and he attended pro war rallies as a wounded veteran. And, wow. uh, and then not only that, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and not only that, he mm. went on to become the president of the Boys and Girls Club after the war wow wow yeah. who knew wow that's that different very interesting man this is yeah. always wow. something you know everybody's stories i love that you're sharing the stories of the, of those who fought and uh everyone again mikeguardia.com is a website you can get his book danger forward on amazon uh and all goodreads all those places go check it out but um also just go to mikeguardia.com follow him on say, uh, facebook twitter and youtube those are the three main places right did i yeah yeah, you don't do Instagram. Let me get you on Instagram. Come on. <laughs> I think I'll do it one of these days. Come, yeah. come on to the other side. <laughs> okay. No, no but <laughs> anyway, no, always good. So looking forward to our next conversation with you. Uh, that will always. be for January. So we'll be talking mm. about Pearl Harbor and Afghanistan cool. and uh, look forward to that. So thank you so much, Military Mike. Everyone keep up with us at BigBlendRadio.com and watch out for Mike's segments every first Monday here on Big Blend Radio. <laughs>